Hello, and welcome to this video for the Physics 132 lab that introduces the ideas of the normal distribution and standard deviation, which we will see are related concepts. If you go to this link provided in your book, it will take you to a nice simulation provided by FET about probability. This will be the page you will see. Let's click the lab and explore. So what this is is a Plinko board. If I drop a ball, you can see it goes plunk, 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 plunk down the board and ends up in one of the bins at the bottom. In this case, two in a row. I drop one more. There we go. It ends up in a different bin. Now, we are going to increase the impact by making more and more bins. Uh, this slider tells you that the probability of a ball going left or right when it hits a peg is 50-50. So half the time the ball bounces left and half the time the ball bounces right on its way down. So now let's just drop a mess of balls in there and see what happens. So down they go, plunk, 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 50-50 each time. And as the balls begin to hit the bottom and fill the bins, at first it seems kind of a random smatter, but as time goes on, we see a particular shape beginning to form. We see a shape known as a bell curve or a normal distribution or a Gaussian. And with more and more spheres, they begin to fill. It's not perfect. It's not perfect yet. You can see we have maybe a, more than you might expect in this bin. But if you let this keep running to about 500 balls or so, it will begin to fill this up quite nicely. And I recommend you do that. So let's turn this off and see what happens when it's not a 50-50 when the ball hits a peg. Let's make it like a 30%. So what this means is as the ball falls, it means 30% of the time it will go right and 60% of the time it will go left. You see here it's going left more often than it's going right as it plunks its way down. Okay, so let's turn this on, drop a mess of them, and see what happens. Down they go. And at first we get, again, a kind of a random smatter. But as time progresses, lo and behold, once again, we begin to fill out the same bell curve. The only difference is that the bell curve is shifted to the left. So we don't need a 50-50 probability to get this to work. Just 30, 60 probabilities over and over and over again will still fill out this bell curve. So this is an example of what is known as the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem says that with independent random variables or independent measurements, like the independent coins that you have in your lab, or the independent pegs that the balls hit on your way down, if you have a lot of them, the result will tend towards a normal distribution, also called a Gaussian or colloquially because of its shape, a bell curve. While this is not always true, there are particular mathematical conditions that must be met, it happens often enough that people generally assume, sometimes to their detriment, that their measurements will fill out a normal distribution. So let's talk about the normal probability distribution for a minute. So here's a probability distribution, normal, and we can see the variable on the horizontal axis. Here we're thinking about a continuous variable. For example, time, like in the dropping ball example from the prior video. On the vertical axis, we have what's known as probability density, and we'll return to that in a moment. As, as a probability distribution, the area under this curve is defined to be one, 100% because the probability of something happening is 100%. And the Gaussian is characterized by two numbers, mu, which is the central location. So here, the red curve has a mu of 50. I can draw another one, which has a mu of 30, and you can see it just shifts the bell curve to the left to be centered on 30 instead of being centered on 50. The other important variable is sigma, the width. So the black curve, still has mu at 50, but the width is now 7. You can see it, it's skinnier. But if the area underneath must be 1, then in order to make it skinnier, I must also make it taller, right? get spikier, for lack of a better word. So what do I mean by probability density? What does this vertical axis mean? 
The probability density means that the probability of a measurement falling within a particular range is the area under the curve, the, the integral in calculus terms for that range. So here, I've shaded in the probability of measuring somewhere between 50 and 60. So if these were times, for example, and I wanted to know what was the probability of measuring between 50 and 60 seconds, well, I would calculate the area under this curve, and that would tell me the probability of measuring between 50 and 60 seconds. Now you can see why the area underneath must be 1, because the probability of something happening must be 100%. The formula for this black curve is, is kind of ugly. You can see it depends upon mu, the central location, sigma the width, and then x is our, is our variable on the horizontal axis, the continuous variable in this case, and this is a big ugly formula. The thing out front, the one over sigma square root two pi, ensures that the area underneath is in fact equal to one. So you've probably guessed that mu is the mean of your data, but what is sigma? I mean, we know it's the width of our distribution, but what more is it than that? It's the standard deviation of your data. And it describes how spread out your data are, right? Is it a wide fat distribution or a narrow skinny one? If you have a sample from some population, you calculate the standard deviation using this formula, which is super ugly. So we'll go through it piece by piece to understand how this formula works. So for each data point, xi, what you do is you subtract it from the mean, so you have to calculate the mean first, and then you square it. The squaring it serves the important function, it makes all the terms positive. This means that data points that happen to be above the mean we can't cancel out points that are below the mean. All the effects will add up as we go along. And then we take all these answers and we add them all up, divide by the sample size, minus one, and then take the square root. Technically, this is called the corrected sample standard deviation, although you don't need to know that term, but you might have seen it in the statistics course, and it's often assumed to be a good estimate of the standard deviation of the population, although there are specific conditions that must be met for that assumption to be true. So in summary, sigma is the standard deviation describing the spread of your data, which means it's also describing the width of the normal distribution that your data are presumably being drawn from. Now let's come back to the ideas of area and probability. So remember the area under the curve is the probability. So one nice feature of the normal distribution is that in terms of sigma, the areas are always constant. So here I have a normal distribution. Uh, here's the center, the mean. If I'm within one standard deviation above or below, then we can expect a measurement plus or minus one sigma to occur about 68% of the time. We can expect it to occur within two sigma about 95% of the time, and three sigma 99.7% of the time. These are really good numbers to have sort of in your head because in many research papers that you might read, you'll read about one sigma, two sigma, three sigma effects. And so knowing these 68, 95, 99.7 rule, as it's called, can be really helpful to help you understand, okay, in terms of probability, what are these results talking about? So as I said, one nice feature of the normal distribution is that if I'm looking in terms of sigma, in terms of ab instead of absolute values, in terms of numbers, the area is always the same. It doesn't matter how much I stretch this distribution or squeeze it down, the area between minus one sigma and plus one sigma is always going to be 68%. So let's do an example going through all of this. Let's use the same falling ball example we used in a prior video to, to see how this all works. So here are my observations. You remember they bounced kind of around pi from my watch. So how, let's go and calculate the standard deviation. In order to do that, we first have to calculate the mean. So we add them all up and divide by four to get the mean. Then for each data point, we go through and calculate the difference from the mean. So 3.142 minus 3.143 gives us minus 0.001. And we repeat that for all the numbers. Then we take each value and square it. So minus 0.001 squared is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 7. And we repeat that for all the values. 
then we add them up, then we divide by n minus 1, which in this case is 3, and then we take the square root to get the standard deviation. Let's repeat using your watch, which you'll recall had a larger spread. Once again, we need to calculate the mean, which we know how to do, add them all up and divide by 4. Then we go point by point and subtract from the mean. So 5.312 minus 5.370 is minus 0 0.058. Repeat that for all the data points. Take each answer and square it. So minus 0 0.058 squared is 0 0.003364. Repeat that for all the numbers. Add them all up like that. Divide by n minus 1, again in this case 3. Take a square root, and we get a standard deviation of 0.289. OK. So here are our two standard deviations. You can see they're quite different, which we would expect. My watch had much less spread, so it has a much smaller deviate, standard deviation than your watch did. It has a much larger standard deviation. The standard deviation is therefore a measurement of the statistical uncertainty of your data. So this is actually connected to how you should handle and write numbers in this lab class. And you might be thinking to yourself, wait, how, how is this at all connected? Well, here's how. So you'll notice in the previous example, I kept all the digits during the calculations. You should always do this, never round until the end. That, that's just in general good practice for any course. Then at the end, you should use your uncertainty to write your numbers and not some significant figures rules. Hopefully this example and this lab will show you why. So in the our example, my watch had a standard deviation of 0 0.00208. Okay, I'll round that to one digit, 0 0.002, and then round my mean to that same number of places. So my, sig my standard deviation is 0 0.02, I round my mean to that same third decimal place, and I get 3.143. However, the standard deviation for your watch was 0.289. I'm gonna round that to one digit, call it 0.3, and then I'm going to round the mean to that same digit, 5.4 plus or minus 0.3. Now, using the significant figures rules, all the measurements had three significant figures. So the significant figures rules would tell us to keep the same number of digits for both measurements. But this is a much more exact representation of the precision of our measurement, right? My watch is much more precise, and so we're keeping more digits, and we're keeping fewer digits for your watch because it's less precise. And we're using the data itself to tell us how many digits to keep. Now let's think a little bit more about how we can understand these numbers. So these uncertainties, these statistical uncertainties, are now measured, and they're one standard deviation. So what does that mean? So if we use the usual assumption that our data follow the normal distribution, how often will my watch read a value in the range of 3.141 to 3.145? Well, 3.141 to 3.145, if my standard deviation is 0 0.002, then this range is one standard deviation. And so we expect that my measurements will fall in this range about 68% of the time, which means about 32% of the time, which is one time in three, right? Because 33% is a third, so one time in three, I should measure a number outside of this range. So representing your numbers using standard deviations means that you can look at outliers and sort of get a better sense of like, is this actually that weird? Or, or and should I look into it? Or is this just normal, right? 32% of the time, my watch should give me a number outside of this range. So in summary, standard deviation provides a way for you to determine the statistical uncertainty from your data. And this can give a different, and we argue, more exact way of representing your uncertainties as opposed to guessing the per precision of your measuring tool or using the significant figures rules. You're using the data to tell you what to do. Moreover, if you use standard deviation, then the uncertainties can be used to understand the probability of what may appear to be outliers due to uh, the properties of the normal distribution. This concludes this video.